anyone has their AI with them today, they need to remove it before the um, session, before the before the forecast and workshop begins. So like you can have it in here for another 30 minutes and then you need to remove it. If you haven't removed it, we're going to um, manually kick out any of the like Otter AI note-taking stuff. But with that, I think we're ready to begin. Um, Angan, I know you have some slides with you. Do you wanna pop them up on the screen now and do a quick introduction of yourself before you jump into them? Sure. Um, one second, let me, as I always say, I'm more of a Google Meet guy, so share screen. Um, one second, let's do view. Full screen, <clears throat> can everyone see that? Perfect. And oh wait, you know what? Close this. Sorry, give me one sec. I'll do okay. it from PDF. <clears throat> Most there. All right. View full screen. Is that good? Yes. All right, so 101, um, why 101? Because uh, I took too many classes in university called 101. Why financial modeling? Because I've been doing it for 21 years, one way or another. What's 2121? Um, that's 21 friends I've known for more than 21 years. Instead of me showing up with uh, 5K or 10K checks, I figured we could show up with bigger checks and uh, <clears throat> support founders, um, you know, in a more um, sizable, um, with more sizable checks and with uh, hopefully more sizable uh, push. Um, I'm originally very quick. Um, I'll try to do this in 30 seconds or at least 60 at most. Um, I'm from Istanbul, Turkey, which is where I grew up. Um, lived there till I was 17, went to the US for college, um, was at Yale, studied economics and political science, graduated 2002. Went into aircraft finance, started in New York, moved to London, moved to Hong Kong, moved to Tokyo, 2004 for what was supposed to be one month. Stayed there for 17 years. Um, I started producing films on the side. I've produced eight films while I was still working in finance. Um, <clears throat> I ran the Yale Club of Japan for about 12 years. I moved back to London, 2021, January. Um, I figured what's the worst country you could move to during lockdown. Um, so um, <clears throat> London, I came back. Um, having raised um, between us um, double digits, mid double digits round um, for Mubi, which is a film um, streaming platform um, and a distributor offline as well. Um, so I became their first CFO and at this point their last CFO as well. Um, I left March, 2022 um, and uh, I've been, a student since then, um, I wrote a dissertation on how Web3 is creating new revenue streams for um, musicians. Um, and I've also started 2121 about um, three, four months ago. We've uh, closed six deals. We have another four that will be closing this week. Um, so it's been a fast start. Um, 10 deals in about 12 weeks. Um Check sizes typically have been um, 30,000 pounds to about 60. Um, I care more about the number of people um, who are going into deals. As I said, friends I've known for more than 21 years. Um, so we've gotten to know each other. That's why it's an angel cartel and not an angel syndicate, uh, because we could possibly take bullets for each other without further ado, financial modeling 101. First impressions matter. Um, when you send me a model, um, when I'm when I'm giving it time and energy and hopefully a little bit of blood and sweat, um, when I click it open, these are not things I want to see. Um, external sources. I'll be very blunt in this whole presentation. Hopefully, you'll be constructive. Um, I generally don't like um, speaking in bullshit, so absolute red flag, and not not even a red flag. I will literally most likely not look at your model if it has external sources. It's a, it's a red line. External links, never a good thing. Circular references, never a good thing. Um, colors, more acceptable, but generally, and we'll get there, 
I, I, I have enough colors in my life. I don't need to see colors in a model. Hidden cells, grouped cells and hidden cells are different, columns and rows, um, but these are probably okay. Refs, divs, absolutely not okay. Um, those little triangles, that just means you didn't click on the cell and click okay. Formatting for me is really important. If I'm giving it time, then you shouldn't make my eyes bleed. These are all things that makes my eye bleed. Instead of me focusing on numbers, I'm focusing on the formatting. I cannot look through this stuff, right? As someone who spent 20 years looking at Excel, I don't want to see these things. These are all things that tell me you didn't bother to have an extra set of eyes before sending this out to a potential investor. This could have, these errors could have easily cost you 50,000 pounds or possibly more if you send me a model that has this stuff in it. These numbers you have in the bottom, you probably know what that is. If a number is too big, too big for a cell and you haven't widened your columns, this is what happens. How do you fix all this? You print. You print it on paper. Make sure you set your um, models every single page to a printable format and you print. You don't have a printer? Go somewhere that has a printer. Print and look at it on paper. You see things on paper that you will never, ever be able to see when you're looking at it on the screen. Moving on. 21 years and 21 words. I won't have um, enough time to go into all of these, but I'll mention what they are. Blue versus black. Um, <clears throat> all the color that I want to see in a model when I'm looking at it or when I'm building one. Okay, I'll talk about all these because I've built quite a few of these. Why do I care about these when I build a model? Blue versus black. When you have a model with, let's say, 20 tabs or even 10 tabs, how do I know what's driving the model? It's the hard codes that are driving the model where you're putting in numbers into cells. Those need to be blue. The, the stuff that I'm going to, the formatting that I'm talking about, this is very old school sort of US investment banking formatting. At the end, you see print and audit. The reason I say print and audit is because these formatting guidelines are really from 20, 25, 30, 40 years ago when models are essentially printed on paper and presented to you know, your MDs. If you're an analyst, your associate, your associate presents to your VP, your VP presents to an executive director, your, your ED to an MD, your MD to the client. So at the end of the day, you have special printing departments and investment banks that basically print the model or the whole presentation presented. That's where a lot of this logic is coming from and it still makes sense. So blue versus black, we can get back there when we're looking at the models. More sheets, less rows. I know investment banking templates, you have 200 rows in a, um, in a worksheet. I personally don't like that. I like sheets that are thematic. If it's your revenue buildup, that's one sheet. If it's your expenses, it's one sheet. If it's your salaries, that's one sheet. That's your staff. You have all of these, think of it as building up to sort of your more granular sheets, building up to intermediate sheets, building up to output sheets, things that you'll actually print and put into your deck, your presentation at the end. So going from granular input and assumption sheets, building up towards an ultimate output sheet. Same month, same column. When you have a monthly model, let's say for five years, that's 60 months, you don't want your March 2025 to be column X in one sheet and column Z in another sheet. Formula auditing for yourself becomes impossible when you don't have your months, I call this being parallel. Every single sheet has to be parallel when it comes to you know, your months. Um, you might have quarterly sheets, you might have annual sheets. The way I personally do is it's okay to have empty columns if your March 2025 is column X, and you're linking to a quarterly sheet, leave your January and February sheets empty, uh, sorry, columns empty, leave them empty. You can hide them or you can group them. You can show them if I ungroup them that they're empty. That's fine. As long as your quarterlies are always whatever the same column, your X is always March 2025. Line means sum. I don't like formatting these tables, this, that, lines, no. The only lines that I have 
when I build a model is if there's a line, it means it adds up everything that's above the line, okay? There could be five rows, there could be two rows. A line means it adds up everything above it. It doesn't multiply, doesn't divide, doesn't subtract. Never hide, never hide columns, never hide rows. You can group them. I'm not a huge fan. Grouping is better than hiding. When you hide, if I unhide and I see something that's wrong, it's horrible. When you're adding 15 columns and 10 are hidden, guess what? If you have a hidden number in a hidden column, which you might have forgotten about or it's left over from an earlier model, it will go into the sum. It will screw things up. Hiding never helps. Never subtract. What does that mean? If you have a neg if you have expenses, expenses are negative. At the end of the day, when you draw a line, you want to add everything above the line. Okay. Your expenses are negative numbers. Don't have expenses as positive numbers and then subtract inside a cell. Never subtract. Ex negative things are negative numbers. They should always be negatives. Never use the red font. Remember, blue, black, never red. Red is a sign that you're losing money. Red is bad. A company in the red, red, no. No reds. Print an audit. I already talked about, so I'm going to move on. You want to impress? So you have your basics, and then you have your bells and whistles. Income statement, or PNL, as you call it, everyone has it. Revenue, expenses, staff. If you don't have these, you probably shouldn't be calling in a model. I'm being very blunt again. Then you start getting me interested once you throw in a balance sheet, a cash flow, a DCF, and then your historical financials in the same format, your assumptions and your sensitivities. I know some of these may be going over your head. Balance sheet, you could say that you're not a balance sheet business. Guess what? Most businesses, most startups may not be balance sheet businesses, but you will have assets on your balance sheet. And it's important to get your cash flow. It's called the three statement model, income statement, balance sheet, cash flow. If you have your three statements and you have the three of them linking and flowing properly, when you send me a model, you're starting five nil. You're not starting one nil, you're starting five nil. If I've looked at 20 models in the last two months, guess what? Only one of them has had a balance sheet. So don't you want to be the one model among the 20 that an investor looks at? You automatically start in the top 5%. Now you don't have mistakes in that model that actually flows. Your five nil becomes 10 nil. Um, <clears throat> whistles, and we're getting really funky and really wow here. Monthly, quarterly, annual. You can do your calculations monthly. You can build up to quarterly. Then you can, your quarterly can build up to annual. Your output pages in the deck could be a five-year or three-year annual is what you show in the deck. But in the model, you know that your annual is the tip of the iceberg. What's underneath in the iceberg is your monthly and quarterly. Scenarios. You can have different sheets for scenarios. What's even better? is if you have your main assumptions or your driver sheet where you can literally change scenarios, one, two, three, you can have a base case, an aggressive case. If you expect, let's say, regulatory change coming, you can have a regulatory change scenario. So giving the investors the flexibility to play around in your model without having to build their own model and still run sensitivities and scenarios inside your model, again, you're at a very high level you really picked my interest because you know what you're doing. You know how to play around with your numbers. You know how to represent your business in a numerical way that an investor or anyone that's financially literate or numbers literate can understand. Compaq, comps, comparable companies, comparable acquisitions, precedent transactions. If you can show me that you understand what your publicly traded comparables are, even though sizes may vary, or you show me what previously acquired companies in your segment are with the actual multiples you get from, let's say, a pitch book or elsewhere, then you're really starting to get to me. Then I'm really like, okay, this is how I would have done this. I really like what I'm seeing on paper, what I'm seeing in Excel. Learn the lingo. I'm not going to go over this. There are 21 numbers, uh, numbers, 21 terms on here. Um, you should really know these. When I sit, sit with you 
and spend an hour, hour and a half looking at your model. If I tell you what's your EV, what's your EV, beta, what's your monthly um, burn, how much runway do you have? Where's your ESOP? You know, um, what else do you have in your DD? Or, you know, what else do I get um, as part of DD? What's your CAC? What's your LTV? How does your churn impact your CAC and LTV? All these questions, what's your CAGR? You should, I know, I know, and I know um, Hotbed has a good um, lingo. Uh, I remember seeing it, a good lingo section as well. Some of these may not be on there. These are more modeling and financial related. Look, I'm not asking you to be an accountant, but this is all about representing your business with numbers in a financially acute way that an investor at the end of the day can digest and then they can make their return calculations based on what you have. Um, <clears throat> these are a lot of different models. You'd probably, well, not probably, you'd be starting with a three statement model, hopefully. Um, as I mentioned, there's budget elements involved in there. Down the road, hopefully you'll be, you might be building an IPO model and LBO is a leverage buyout. You could grow enough to get some um, leverage and maybe do a buyout of your existing investors. DCF is basically a valuation uh, methodology, discounted cash flow, MA, who knows? You may be acquiring stuff, acquiring other companies down the road, um, forecasting, obviously, budget and forecasting are elements that go into this. Um, consolidation, that's when you have different entities in different jurisdictions, you're consolidating on a month or really your CFO or your um, head of accounting is consolidating on a monthly or quarterly basis. Option pricing, probably not relevant uh, for many of you. So there are hundreds or um, tens of different financial models, obviously. So <clears throat> question, operational fundraising. This was a point that Purdy raised, and I think it's very valuable. So what do you think belongs where? What's an operational model? What's a fundraising model? Are they different things? Where do you think these belong? Monthly. Now, anyone um, anyone can shout out. Do you think monthly is operational or fundraising? Anyone, don't be shy. Being shy never helps anyone. Operational. All right, it's certainly operational. Um, I would argue it's operational and fundraising. Um, I know when I say which is which, you are tempted to, to choose one or the other. Um, I'd say it's, it's both. Um, three years and 18 to 24 months. The reason I put those on there is many people say, you know, or they want to show three years in a fundraising model, three years of forecasts. <clears throat> many investors want to see monthly 18 to 24 months because guess what? It's usually cash flow. Well, not usually. It's always cash flow that takes startups or any company um, bankrupt or illiquid is when you run out of cash, right? And how do you show um, cash flow? In a monthly model where you show what's coming in is enough to cover the cash that's coming in is enough to cover all the cash that needs to go out, right? So you may be deferring your own salary, but if you have 15 employees, guess what? Most of them will not work if you don't give them cash on a monthly basis because they have cash obligations. So what I personally like to do is really do it all monthly. I know this sounds like it's a lot of work, but once you have... Once you build the right skeleton in a model, doing it monthly versus quarterly versus annual is actually not that different. What I personally do is when I'm raising, I use the same operational model that I use because when you show an operational model on a monthly basis to an investor, guess what? Rounds typically don't close within a month. Every month, you can actually start putting actual financials. You can show how your KPIs are hopefully improving on a monthly basis. And then your investors actually start trusting your numbers a lot more because you have your actuals coming in to a dynamic model that's evolving on a monthly basis. ROI, return on investment. Oh, sorry, exit options I put twice. Um, exit options, return on investment. I personally don't like seeing these things, even in fundraising models. Guess what? You can only give your investors the valuation that you think your company is going to get. But when you exit, how you exit, what returns they will make, their cost of capital, you don't know these things. So when someone comes and tells me, you know, today I'm selling shares at one, dot, one pound, um, in three years, I'm going to be at 22 pounds. Guess what? No, you can't look at a globe and say in three years, I'll be 22 pounds. Of course, the model is delivering some kind of a DCF valuation or other valuation metrics. 
but giving telling an investor you're going to make this much return i'm like yeah right we'll see you in three years so that to me is unnecessary let the investors decide for themselves what they think their return is going to be conservative aggressive um <clears throat> i personally like to have different scenarios the base case i try to be very conservative uh, with the base case aggressive you can start getting aggressive you could call it a growth case or whatever case the second scenario or the third scenario if you want to have three scenarios um annual versus quarterly again i think quarterly uh, sorry monthly building up to quarterly building up to annual i think both operational and fundraising models should have that now what you have in your internal operational model, you don't necessarily want to show all of that to investors, and that's perfectly fine. Um, and I, as a CFO, I was doing the same thing. I probably had 10 sheets that I wasn't showing to investors. Not that I was hiding it from them, but a lot of stuff they did not necessarily have to see. Uh, my monthly um, churn, for example, if they asked for it or I'd included in my investor update, but I wouldn't show it to them inside the model or I had side models um, that basically included that. I know this was supposed to be more interactive, but we're getting to the interactive uh, part. I'm going to shut up there. And um, I know that was quite quick and you're probably like, what's going on here? But I'm going to stop there and you can go wild with your questions. I'm hoping, um, first of all, thank you so much. That was great. I found a great site that walks you through how to calculate all the different abbreviations that you mentioned. So founders, I'll circulate that afterwards. And Engen, will we be able to get a copy of the slides? I feel like people are probably going to. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course, I'll send that. Okay, we're going to try to cover a couple of questions before we move into the workshop bit. Um, but Malcolm, you're going to be going first. So be ready to go in like five minutes or so. Um, First of all, Engen, what what would you advise for founders who say, look, like I'm a technical founder. I've just been focused on building the product. My co-founder has been focused on finding our first users. We don't even have any revenue. Um, why should I spend the next, you know, week to 10 days trying to perfect all these financial forecasts when I'm pulling numbers from the sky? Well, um, I would tell them no model, no money. Um, show me one investor that has invested without seeing a model. If they do, that's not me. And that's not many people that I know. This is about how you, in, if you can't show me numerically what your dream is, as in what, what are you trying to build? What success am I investing in? What potential success am I investing in? Guess what? I mean, it's not, I'm not gonna say it's not worth my time, but if you can't, and it is not worth my time, if you cannot take the time, if you cannot invest blood, sweat, and tears into representing your dream numerically, then guess what? Your, how is your investor supposed to know what they're investing in? Everything that Anthony talked about in a term sheet, guess what? A term sheet is tip of the iceberg. You need to have your model, your due diligence, your data room, your company this, your company that, your legal docs, this, 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 this. It all ends up in a term sheet and me giving you an offer to invest or other investors coming in to invest. So for me, it's very simple. No model, no money. All right. And um, and I don't know, I don't know any investor who will not say this. I understand the point. I'm not saying you need to be a CFO. I'm not saying you need to build your own model. I'm not saying you should spend, you know, three weeks building a model. I've spent two and a half months. When we raced for Mubi, I spent two and a half months building that model. But guess what? The investor that came in, they looked at the model. They had their associate working on it for three weeks. And they said, this is the best model we've ever seen. They couldn't find a single mistake. And, you know, we got more than $30 million investment from a single institutional investor. That's how it works. You start five nil. For a founder who is sitting down to build out their first financial model, um, what's a good place to start? Uh, very good question. Um, so there are a bunch of templates online. Um, I know this is not the answer you're looking for, but because each business is unique, you should probably study 10 templates and then... I know this is the scary part. Start with an empty 
Excel workbook. Because what you need to build is your business. The logic will be similar to what you've seen, but I personally would not recommend starting with a template and plugging numbers in. That's what investment banking analysts do. You have these 250 page models and they just stick numbers in it. What would be great is if you or a member of your staff starts building a model from scratch because then you really own the model. Once a borrowed model in two months, three months, six months, or 12 months, then it's going to start stinking. You're not going to, there are going to be bits and pieces in it that you don't own. And that could, excuse my French, come to bite you in the ass down the road. You really want to avoid that. Again, you don't need to be an accountant. You don't need to be a CFO. You don't need to be an ex-banker. You need to be a little comfortable with numbers. If you're building a company, numerical literacy is important. We're not looking for an investment banker to get funded here. We're looking for someone who can numerically represent their dreams in a model. So I'm happy to help. I work with a lot of founders from this perspective. Um, for me, it's also a very good way of doing due diligence on people because it shows me how coachable they are and how quickly they can actually grasp numerical literacy. Right. Um, okay, it's gonna be the last question before we go to Malcolm. Um, while um, over the next minute or so, if you have an AI note taker in here, please remove it. I know Pody is kicking some out already, um, but please do so if you haven't. Um, okay, and my last question is, I know a lot of founders when they're creating these models kind of wrestle with like, how do you, um, how do you choose growth factors that reflect your ambition, but don't kind of get into the um, delusion um, category. And so like how, how should founders think about that? But then also if you're looking at one, two, three or forecasts, are there any, um, guidelines that you have around what revenues and one what what does a revenue I guess like what are benchmarks to show that this is right for angel investors or for VCs are, are there certain multiples that people need to be showing in the forecast um that's a good question that's probably a, a billion dollar question the second one um I mean as I said it really um I mean this is I was in Japan for 17 years the Japanese answer to everything is it's a case, but it, it's a case by case uh, basis. But that is really what it is. It really depends on each individual business. Um, some of the companies that I'm uh, that I'm looking at now, people have told me that they don't think that's venture backable. What does that mean? It means it's a company that could become a cash cow, but may not give you a ten times, twenty times, hundred times um, exit. Right. So what do you need to show? Uh, you know, that's a really tough question. And I don't really have the answer to it. Um, the, the first part of the question um, is not getting delusional. Um, I think that's where having different scenarios actually helps because you can have a super conservative base case. Now, remember, your investors, if the, your potential investors, if they invest, you will actually be sort of liable to these people because you've taken money from them. So in three months, in six months, in nine months, you'll actually, they'll expect you to compare your actuals to your projections. So guess what? It never hurts. Under promise, over deliver. So your base case should really be, I'm going to be relatively comfortably exceeding this. That's your base case. Your growth case or your, you know, uh, whatever you call it, your gas case is I'm going to be pushing on gas. This is my growth case. You know, I'm going to be maybe giving up some efficiency, especially if you're in a SaaS kind of business, you're going to be increasing your CAC, but really stepping on the gas, that's going to be your growth case. So you're going to be burning more, but you're going to be showing growth uh, much faster, um, hopefully. And that's, Again, should not be a delusional case. It should be a, you should know your, let's say your customer acquisition costs well enough. I know 
this doesn't apply to everyone, but you should know your CAC and your churn and your LTV well enough to know what stepping on the gas actually means. So your growth case is also not delusional. So all your cases should really be, um, you know, under promise and over deliver. And it really should be dependent on the amount of capital you take in, how much you, and the nature of that capital. Obviously, when you're a $25 million ARR business, you're raising $50 million. That's growth capital, right? That is for you to step on the gas. When you're pre-revenue and you're raising 250K SEIS, that's not necessarily what is considered growth capital. So there you have a lot more expenses. You're covering SGNA, you're bringing on your first developers and so on. I know that's a long-winded answer to answer that, but not to get delusional, always ask yourself in six to 12 months, can I over deliver based on these numbers? And if the answer is no, you got to pull your numbers down because what you don't want is in six months for you to spend half an hour or an hour and a half trying to explain why you could not deliver your projections. That you really want to avoid. You really trust me and I've had to do it when your CFO or when your CFO has to go to the board together with the CEO and stand in front of five people and tell them why you couldn't deliver what you promised, that is not the position you want to be in. So under promise, over deliver. All right. And with that, we are going to move into the forecasting bit. Um, all the AIs have been kicked out. How do you do when you stop recording?